century ago, the American prairie, a native ecosystem comprised of hundreds of species, was disappearing as fast as the buffalo and the passenger pigeon. This is the story of the beginning of prairie preservation, of the first piece of virgin prairie publicly protected as a floral preserve through the efforts of the writer and conservationist Aldo Leopold. Along the west bank of the Crawfish River near Lake Mills, Wisconsin, a low wet prairie originally covered 1,800 acres. By the time Aldo Leopold first came to the area in the 1930s, only 15% of it remained alive. Professor Leopold set out to try to save some of the virgin prairie with the help of Stoughton Favel, an octogenarian farmer who had been born right there on the family homestead in 1850 and who loved its prairie wildflowers. Dave Tillotson is the grandson of Stoughton Favel and lives on the family farm today. This once upon a time was a wild prairie as far as you could see down here. It was an area of uh, short-eared owls flapping around. It was a wilderness area, really. Prairie chickens were booming on this in the late 30s. And uh, they're gone. Uh, they're gone. The shorter owls that were out here flapping around at dusk, they're all gone. The upland plover is gone. The prairie chicken is gone. And a lot of things have gone by the board as the habitat is gone. They've gone. And I don't know if you're ever going to see them back down here again. In the 1920s, botanists from the University in Madison recognized the crawfish prairie as a prime example of native Wisconsin prairie, although its size was dwindling fast as it was being converted to agriculture. So uh, you talk about Jefferson County. Uh, somebody needs to say, look, you have a valuable inheritance here. You should not sell it for a bowl of porridge. I mean, it's here to be preserved. If you don't save it, there's no other place like Favor Prairie, and you better start planning on buying another 800 or 1,000 acres and, and gradually getting back into a viable structure. The prairie itself is a garden that has been in the making since the glacier receded 10,000 years ago. During the growing season, there is a progression of flowers and the prairie changes from day to day. Looking at pictures of the changing colors and the varieties of flowers, it's hard to keep in mind that all this takes place on one little piece of land. In May 1940, Aldo Leopold wrote an essay about the prairie at Favel Grove. Its centerpiece is the eastern white-fringed prairie orchid a fragile member of the prairie community that doesn't survive away from the prairie. Aldo Leopold had come to Fayville Grove because of birds, to work with farmers trying to preserve healthy populations of quail, prairie chickens, and other upland game. He found himself walking through acres of virgin prairie, stepping over orchid plants while counting pheasants. Soon he sought a way to protect the wild prairie, both because he knew that the survival of the upland game birds depended on the prairie, and because the prairie wildflowers themselves were a treasure to be preserved. Aldo Leopold is known as one of the great environmental writers of the 20th century, and is best known for his writings about Wisconsin. However, much of his thinking was formed when he was a young man working for the U.S. Forest Service in the American Southwest. The Gila Wilderness. I think uh, my father was very much involved when the, with the establishment of the first wilderness areas. That was way back when he was uh, on the Apache. If you think about his experience uh, as a forest ranger in, the, in New Mexico and Arizona, and how he watched firsthand the native species uh, overcome by grazing. The gullies developed in these mountain valleys, which we now know um, are completely wrecked. And he could see that, the, uh, that um, by the elimination of the <coughs> native vegetation, the things were going to deteriorate. Uh, but the, the country was deteriorating. 
Leopold was a very good writer, and he clearly understood that the world is going to the dogs. I mean, he was out west. He started out as a hunter. He saw these animals disappearing. Pretty soon, he realized that if people are going to continue killing everything, there's nothing going to be left. I was reading yesterday the title essay of The River of the Mother of God, second to last paragraph, very specifically, and pointing out that in this headlong stampede for speed and ciphers, we are crushing the last remnants of something that ought to be preserved for the spiritual and physical welfare of future Americans. Even at the cost of acquiring a few less millions of wealth or population in the long run. That is, even at the expense of having fewer people and a less rich country. Now this was written in 1924, which is remarkable. By the 1920s, Aldo Leopold was known as a leading voice for conservation in America. Coming to Wisconsin in 1924, he encountered a fragmented landscape with practically all native species of plants and animals in decline because of human activity. In 1933, he chaired the newly created Department of Game Management at the university and set out with a small group of graduate students to work with farmers in developing land use practices that would leave room for wild things. The people on the land are the ones who should be involved in, in understanding the land mechanism. And that was wonderful, the way he could talk to farmers and, and include them in his thinking. I remember as a youngster going with him going over to talk to local farmers, first of all, he would start, how's your, how's your crops doing? Uh, what was the weather like last winter? You know, general topics. And finally get around to asking them about their pheasants and uh, whether there was much upland game and so forth. And zeroing in on the questions much later that he really wanted to find out about. Well, in the 1930s, Professor Aldo Leopold at the University of Wisconsin decided this farm should be one of ten in sort of a study area to examine the uh, chances of improving uh, wildlife situations uh, if you uh, practiced a certain kind of agriculture. He was so interested in helping them, and he did, physically as he did at Fable Grove, helping to build uh, feeding stations and uh, put in uh, what might be habitat structures like brush tangles plantings. I think he was uh, interested in finding out, having students find out more about the upland gay birds we were lucky enough to have here at the time. They were very interested in the quail, of course, and the they were di disappearing, and of course it, there was that terrible winter when they fed them. There was so much snow. Professor Leopold would come out and oftentimes stay for dinner at the farm. They'd have wonderful talk at the dinner table. I remember lots of talks with Grandpa, and he did write Grandpa a few cards from Germany when he was there. He brought university students out to this area, and they sort of farmed them out. And they had a little laboratory in the house behind me on the second floor. So we fed them here in the house, boarded, boarded those researchers, and they would fan out around the neighborhood and do their counts of birds. I uh, first went to Madison as a student of Aldo Leopold uh, in uh, 1935. There was an experimental wildlife area about two miles north of Lake Mills, Wisconsin, and uh, that was to become the study area. And it turned out that uh, after I got acquainted with the area, I realized that uh, the crawfish prairie was part of that study area. Professor Leopold decided to make the Crawfish Prairie or, uh, area and the, the rest of the Fable Grove area as, as a study area for students. And I was put in charge of the, of the area. So these grad students had various uh, programs. They had a winter feeding program and they had a nest year program. It was at that time that uh, Art Hawkins came and uh, Soon after, there was Bob McCabe. Well, he stayed at the Tillotson farm. There was an extra house there. I think Art Hawkins had done this too, had stayed in a room, in two rooms actually, on the second floor. That room was 
was free to the graduate students, but um, they did pay board at the Tillotsons and ate with the Tillotson family. Bob really enjoyed that very much. He was extremely fond, as I said, of the whole family, particularly of what he called Grandpa Fable. They all called him Grandpa Fable. And in fact, Bob kept a picture of him in his office the rest of his life. Stoughton Fable was born on the Fable homestead in 1850, right after Wisconsin became a state. His father and uncle were among those who introduced Holstein cattle and scientific farming methods to Wisconsin, turning it into America's dairy land. Young Stoughton Fable was at the forefront of modern farming, but he also collected Indian relics and loved the prairie wildflowers. As Aldo Leopold became more and more acquainted with Mr. Fable, he uh, realized that he was a very special person, that he was not only interested in his farm operation, but he was maybe equally interested in what was going on around the farm in terms of wildlife and particularly flowers. He was interested in wildflowers. He was sort of an early ecologist, not uh, with a name of an ecologist. Uh, this is the remnant of his uh, little flower garden here. Grandpa had friends, botanists at the university, Dr. Fassett, Dr. Curtis, and um, they were in the habit of coming out to see his wildflower garden. And he had this uh, wildflower garden that he had started over the years, uh, which was right close to the house. And then he had uh, uh, orchids and things of that sort, uh, one of which was uh, an orchid that was named after him. Dr. John Curtis from the university decided that it was indeed a hybrid between two of the cypripediums, so he, he named it after Mr. Fable as a subspecies. Mr. Fable donated his orchid specimen to the Arboretum in Madison, but it died out. And I remember one time uh, Aldo Leopold had his daughter Estella with him and we walked up towards the river. When you're talking about the prairie orchids, he spoke about them a lot at the dinner table and he wrote a little essay called Exit Orchids, which was, I think, inspired by uh, the concern over loss of native prairie at areas like Fable Grove. A very poignant statement. Professor Leopold tried for years to interest the university in buying a particularly beautiful and diverse 80-acre piece that was up for sale. His efforts failed. In May 1940, Professor Leopold wrote an essay entitled Exit Orcas about the prairie remnant that they were trying to purchase. Wisconsin conservation will suffer a defeat when, at the end of this week, 75 cattle will be turned to pasture on the Fable Grove Prairie. Long known to botanists as one of the largest and best remnants of unplowed, ungrazed prairie sod left in the state. In it grow the white lady slipper, the white fringed orchis, and some 20 other prairie wildflowers which originally carpeted half of southern Wisconsin, but most of which are now rare due to their inability to withstand cow or plow. All this was going on when Lognecker and, and, uh, and, and I, Leopold and Gallistel and company were all working toward developing the Arboretum. Thirty miles away, a CCC camp on the University of Wisconsin Arboretum has been busy for four years artificially replanting a prairie in order that botany classes and the public generally may know what a prairie looked like and what the word prairie signifies in Wisconsin history. References to prairie are common in southern Wisconsin, but the prairies are almost all gone. In the mid-1930s, a group of professors, botanists, horticulturists, and sociologists, with Leopold among them, successfully petitioned the University of Wisconsin to establish an arboretum included were plans to re-establish acres of native prairie plants. The CCC came in and uh, was available to the delight of, of Fassett and Leopold and we went in with the CCC crews to get the material for uh, the arboretum. Because those young men of course didn't know prairie plants, they had to have somebody along to say take this, take that, take that, and so as students of Fassett's and uh, Leopold, we were out there working with them and we would ride with the crews 
on the uh, CCC trucks. All the way to much, much of that material came from the bluffs along the Wisconsin River. Uh, we would stop along the way, of course, and entertain them uh, with a drink or two. It encouraged people in uh, CCC to enjoy working with uh, botanists. <laughs> the University Arboretum in Madison was, was the first attempt by a whole cluster of professors to restore the landscape to its snake, to its, what was it like before white man plowed it up? But it was my father, but a handful of other professors who were doing it together. And my feeling is that my father enjoyed it so much that that's when he bought his own property to do it on his own. During the years that Professor Leopold worked to preserve the Fayville Prairie and establish a restored prairie at the Arboretum, he purchased the land at the shack, the old farm that became the subject of his book, A Sand County Almanac. I think what Dad did at the shack was particularly interesting because he bought a piece of worn out, messed up, abused land and he didn't build anything fancy on it. He, we lived it, we spent our weekends in the little old chicken coop. But it was the land that was being restored and that was the big issue. I think when we first started, I was about eight years old, but um, we had uh, five siblings there uh, to help, all of them older than I. And uh, we were at first thinking that this was kind of fun. Dad was, uh, was looking along on the highway rights of way to find places where he could see native plants growing that were not destroyed by farming. We did a lot of, of uh, transplanting uh, from reclamation sites where we knew a house was going to be built and we'd move wildflowers into the woods. And... We discovered a, a series of orchids not far away from the shack. They were actually a very simple ones. They were the other light lady slipper, if I recall. And Mother moved a couple of plants uh, into the little garden that she had right in front of the shack itself. And within weeks, they were stolen by uh, strangers who came in and dug them up for Mother's plant garden. These are two landmarks in the history of ecological restoration the private project undertaken by the Leopold family at the shack, and the public prairie plantings at the Madison Arboretum. This synthetic prairie is costing the taxpayer 20 times as much as what it would have cost to buy the natural remnant at Fable Grove. It will be only a quarter as large. The ultimate survival of its transplanted wildflowers and grasses is uncertain, and it will always be synthetic. Yet no one has heard the appeals of the University Arboretum Committee for funds to buy the Fable Grove Prairie, together with other remnants of rare native flora, and set them aside as historical and educational reservations. Our educational system is such that white-fringed orcas means as little to the modern citizen of Wisconsin as it means to a cow. Indeed, it means less. For the cow, at least, sees something to eat, whereas the citizen sees only three meaningless words. The eastern prairie-fringed orchid requires specific mycorrhizal fungi for its seeds to germinate, and it appears the orchid requires native prairie fungi to stay alive. It does not survive for long when transplanted from its home. What I'm working on, I'm primarily a plant ecologist, and I'm working on the effects of symbiotic fungi on the plant uh, community composition. So if you don't get the fungi in a site, you're not going to get the orchids. They've got a whole different group of fungi that have to go, or they have to migrate. And so the thing is, the orchids have to, the, whatever conditions have the orchids also have to support the fungi that grow with them. Uh, because if the fungus dies, it's the orchid. The orchid also relies upon an insect for pollination. This rare footage was taken at night of orchids that had been transplanted to flower pots when their habitat was destroyed, and the camera captured their pollination by the hummingbird clearwing, or hawk moth. In preparation for the hoped-for floral reservation at Fable Grove, 
The Botany Department and the Department of Wildlife Management of the University have, during the last three years, mapped the location of each surviving colony of rare flowers, and each spring have counted the blooms. It was hoped to measure against these data the response of the flowers to complete future protection. The data will now serve to measure the rate at which destruction by grazing takes place. But it was a very complicated uh, negotiation. That's sort of a matter of uh, Professor Leopold trying to his best to uh, save some of the land before it got away. The problem of ga getting funds at that time were, were extremely difficult, and uh, some of the funds became available but too late and this sort of thing. It was just a very uh, sad thing. And meanwhile, the land had been sold. Some of the people that owned it had moved away, like, like Mr. Kenyon. Most of the prairie was lost just because money was not available at the time that it was needed to save it from turning it into crops and ditching it and that sort of thing. In 1940, the same week that Aldo Leopold wrote Exit Orcas, he and two of his graduate students transplanted lady slipper orchids from the soon-to-be cow pasture over the fence into part of the prairie that was still safe from destruction. At one time there was a prairie mixed to the Fable Prairie. It was going to be plowed, and Leopold heard about it, and I think Art Hawkins was here, plus Bob McCabe, and they spent some time transplanting the little white orchids to the Fable Prairie. It is already known that with the possible exception of ladies' tresses, all of the rarer species succumb to pasturing. And that is why they are rare. Few of them succumb to mowing, hence the past use of the Fable Grove Prairie as hay meadow has not greatly injured its flora. Now I see the trail faintly. Yeah. Max Parch claims that there was a road, and this was the road that came out of this prairie. You can see the grooves in the grass right there. And uh, Max did a study. He's got stakes all over this prairie from 40, 50 years ago. What I had was uh, laid out a grid. Uh, 1,200 feet by 1,500 feet with one of these stakes at every one. So that's 180 points. And at every one of those points, I uh, made a 2 by 2 uh, square quadrat and listed all the plants in there. Max Parch studied the Fable Prairie for 30 years. His working list includes almost 200 plant species found on this tiny piece of land. In contrast, a hundred yards away, the cornfield is an attempt to grow only one species, although a few weeds always creep in. That's pit birds, okay, and bloom today. I happened to be drafted in August of 41. Came out in 45, and when I got back to uh, Madison, uh, Aldo Leopold was full of graduate students, so I went over and uh, became a plant ecologist. I uh, commuted to Madison to the University with Dave and other people from uh, Lake Mills. In my opinion, no individual blame attaches to the owner of the Fable Grove Prairie for converting it to pasture. The public taxes him on the land. It is not his obligation to provide the public with free botanical reservations, especially when all public institutions, from the public school to the federal land bank, urge him to squeeze every possible penny out of every possible acre. No public institution ever told him or any other farmer that natural resources not convertible into cash have any value to it or to him. The white-fringed orcus is as irrelevant to the cultural and economic system into which he was born as the Taj Mahal or the Mona Lisa. Isn't that something? Now, I never found one of these in my quadrat area in the 40s. And the only one I've seen and photographed has, is outside of the area. That is... Almost, almost kneel down for that one. 